All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, next up, uh, we have a formidable guest speaker, uh, Sir Kim, who is a uh, assistant professor here at UCLA in the Department of Communications. Before coming here, he actually got his PhD here at UCLA, then went up to work for Facebook a little bit, but realized, I guess, that LA is much, much nicer than the other part of California. Um, you've already heard a little bit about some of the research that he's been doing with Zachary um, on Tuesday, I think. And so, but he is actually the guy, as Zachary was telling you, who does know about all the technical stuff. So all the questions that you want to ask Zachary, but then feel comfortable, probably as to uh, you. So please feel free to um, welcome him, and then um, let's look forward to the talk. <coughs> So, um, yeah, glad to be here. And then, uh, um, so, yeah, so I work with Zachary, um, who gave a talk yesterday. So, um, assuming uh, you're all familiar with the context of the topic and the studies and data sets that we're using, and I'm also happy to answer any questions um, on the details of the uh, method that we're using, and I will be also covering some details that um, I'm using for other studies. So I will not talk about the study that you heard yesterday. Um, so, yeah, so I got my degree in computer science and engineering, and then I switched <coughs> to um, communication and social science. And then you'll see um, um, how and why I made that um, kind of transition for me. Um, and then, um, then um, so I know that most of you guys are from social science or humanities. So um, I will not talk too much, talk too much about the technical details, but I'm rather focus on um, how you could maybe use these tools for your research in the future, and then uh, also understand uh, what are the kind of risks or pitfalls or kind of unknown vectors, uncertainties, um, and then what are the things that we should be worried about and concerned about when you are using these kind of computational tools. And, and uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me for any questions uh, in the, in, during the talk. So, so these are you know, my high-level goals in my research. So, um, so um, I spent a lot of time, um, long years, um, in computer vision and machine learning, and then um, I'm trying to um, develop specific tools using these techniques of machine learning and computer vision um, that can be used to solve research questions. Not just research questions, I would say just questions in social science and questions in society um, that we are facing. And then, um, and specifically, um, we are trying to understand the human behavior, cognition, social perception, um, social activities, um, cloud behavior, um, many other things um, that we're doing in society and also individual level using this kind of a machine learning based tools using visual data. Um, and then, um, this is um, also an important thing. Um, is this is a very new area in social science using deep learning, machine learning, and then try to incorporate the visual data. And then, um, so now, uh, perform quantitative analysis of uh, non mobile data. This is a very, very new field. Um, no one was doing that um, except myself uh, but a couple of years ago. Uh, but right now, like 2019, there are a couple of people um, in the world who are actually using computer vision for their research. Then I expect there will be growing number of people, especially from junior um, faculty or PhD students who are kind of more open to new methods, um, new tools, and new research questions. So um, what we don't have yet is um, the kind of strong community and network of these people. Um, it's kind of um, difficult to know who are actually doing and working in this area, although we're kind of trying to make them um, you know, workshop and then um, email list kind of things. We're trying to reach out to people who are doing kind of related um, research. So another thing that I want to mention is, um, um, so again, this is a kind of broad area of computational social science, but in my field there are two separate communities. So one is computational social science um, derived by computer scientists like data mining or machine learning or multimedia researchers. Another field or another community is computational social science in social science. 
So those are primarily social scientists who are um, skillful and knowledgeable about those kind of computational tools and then use those tools for their research. The currently the overlap in terms of people are very small. So there are not many people who are <coughs> engaged in two different um, areas. Uh, but um, I think uh, there are more and more people who are kind of connecting um, as kind of function uh, and I think that's a great opportunity for uh, many of the students and, and uh, kind of junior uh, researchers, including myself um, in the near future. So that's kind of background. Um, so, um, so I want to talk briefly about computer vision. Um, although um, I think um, yes, at this point I'm uh, kind of familiar with what computer vision is, what it can do. Uh, what it can do um, <coughs> from the previous um, uh, presentations. So this is one example of computer vision um, called object detection. So <coughs> the task is to find and localize and classify the type of object instances from given images or videos. So you will see car, truck, people, anything. So one example. So kind of more formally, um, the goal of computer vision is um, to automatically understand Understand or retrieve, understand the content, visual content from visual input by automatic <coughs> means. Um, and then, traditionally, there have been uh, kind of two different approaches. One is a statistical learning based vision. So that's what you're more familiar with nowadays. The another approach is um, geometry based vision. And geometry means um, you are actually solving your matrix uh, optimization, like a stereo vision. Um, kind of shape from X, so you don't need to know what that is. But um, um, so, thankfully, because um, um, due to the availability of the really large scale visual data set um, and then popular um, software frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, so the majority of the computer vision community has been focused on um, the learning based vision. So, the actually, the computer vision is um, this really the largest field in computer science and engineering right now. Um, and then um, it's, you might not know that, but um, in computer science, the people usually publish in conference proceedings than journal. So conference proceedings are actually tricky, more rigorous, harder to be accepted than um, journals. And then the, that this conference in computer vision is called CVPR, Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition, is actually being held in Long Beach right now. Um, general chair um, is my advisor, Song Chun Ju, and Mr. Tatarma. And so last week was the machine learning conference. I see it. I see it. And then um, um, the CDP. Those are so really you said big two weeks. <coughs> so really big conferences in computer science, not just in computer science. Actually, if you look at the Google index, they are right below their index. CDP index is almost right below you know, science, nature, and and then um, you know, AS, AS, and those kind of. It's a very rapidly growing field, and then they're they're making tremendous impact, which means their method and then the tools they're developing are rapidly propagating into different fields, not just captured. I mean, kept in the uh, you know computer vision or machine learning. Uh, other computer scientists who use these tools, and then other engineers in any field, civil engineering or um, you know, electrical engineering or or biology and many, many other fields are actually using these deep learning or computer vision machine learning tools um, to sort of um, um, transform their own existing um, research into some of the people. So um, what we're trying to do uh, in my lab is um, to uh, apply those techniques for social science, um, specifically um, related with the, uh, the recent question related to communication. And these are some examples um, applications um, uh, including the one the top is um, myself face being more white and no white <laughs> so, so, communication. Uh, so the center is we're me we're me a couple years ago um, so then um, getting whiter getting known whiter um, and then the other example is pose estimation. Um, you can automatically detect um, your posture, gestures. Um, and then also you can transport images. And then you can segment. You can also transport the style of artwork, um, learn from the artwork, and then transfer that to extra photographs. So many other things. So many other practical applications um, have been demonstrated in the uh, recent literature. Uh, 
So this is very surprising because when I was studying um, computer vision, so I started the computer vision uh, about 15 years ago, and then uh, in the first decade, uh, first 10 years, um, nothing actually worked. Yeah, nothing worked. And then uh, that means uh, there's no computer industry, and then people don't know. People didn't didn't know because they didn't have to know because it doesn't work. Right? Why do you have to know about something that doesn't work? But then that changed uh, really dramatically um, in just recent couple of years. So that's computer vision, um, um, right? This is um, um, the field in, uh, not just in computer science, but computer science and statistics and cognitive science and many other fields have been developing those kind of tools. So what can we do with them? So this is a question um, that I'm asking. Um, so this is cartoon. It's not photograph, but um, um, this is a visual data, and then um, you would see this is a visual messages. And then you need to process um, information at different abstract levels to understand what it means. Okay. Do you recognize him? That's your first one. And then, um, what he's doing is um, um, he's um, Selfie stick. Do you guys all know what selfie stick is? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, um, so and then on top of that selfie stick, um, you have a cameraman who works for Fox News. So, um, like, what computer vision can currently do is uh, probably, once trained properly, then it can recognize the identity of this person. So, based on some unique um, features, visual appearance, it can probably recognize this person is Donald Trump. President of the United States. And then maybe you can recognize the, the actual text label on the camera so it can recognize the box. And then maybe you can also recognize the edge and then uh, you'll see if it's a self stick. But uh, what it doesn't know is the actual meaning, meaning of this message. So you'll see Donald Trump, self stick, cameraman, box news. But what does it mean? What is the context that we are reading? The actual meaning of that um, is, uh, well, he is a controlling media, for example, controversial media. And, and then that gap, right? So, um, so the computer vision has been so um, mature enough, enough to be able to detect those individual individual objects and read the text. But I'm um, going from that level to reach to the level of um, the full comprehension of the actual messages and meanings. Um, is the question that I am not going to answer today. Uh, hopefully in like 20 years. Um, so uh, that's probably a um, long-term goal in AI. So, so but I mean still, it's, it's actually a great leap forward from the, um, from the period where nothing could be actually detected or recognized. Right? But, um, Computer vision has been so well developed, so now we can recognize each individual object. And then uh, most of the uh, cases, um, a lot of the data, a lot of scale data, um, have helped that. But then how do you actually interpret the whole meaning of these images? The answer is not on the data, not just on the data. Um, it'll have to do with the right representation, logic, reasoning. Those are several questions that you know, for the AI researchers and, and cognitive scientists and linguists um, have asked. So probably, well, I don't know the answer, but um, the, probably the approach is to work answering the questions would be uh, related to some of integrating, some of interdisciplinary um, expertise. So, uh, um, so that's kind of the really um, long-term goal. And then, um, well, this is another example. So the message, or, well, is it, is, the direction is different, but probably in the same kind of um, uh, rhetoric and metaphor. So you're using um, a measurement to control the guy. Yes? So this seems um, similar to the situation with the text also, where it's like detecting metaphors, irony, right. sarcasm. Right, yes, right, yes, right? yes. It's yes. going beyond. Yes. But right. it's happening with text. Right. Where there's these yes. methods to detect right. it. Yes. So I would say um, the text um, NLP. The so traditional NLP uh, um, community um, actually have um, um, spent more effort 
on, on uh, understanding higher level um, comprehension. The, the, um, the, um, the, for the field of computer vision, the problem, um, the set of um, four problems were different because um, you couldn't even detect whether there's a person or not, or whether there's a car, or whether there is um, um, anything, any um, specific object in the scene. Um, in contrast, in text, you know, well, this is a word. You know what it means from vocabulary. So I think the starting point of computer vision was a lot more challenging than um, NLP community. But, um, but I think right now, uh, they're kind of on par. This is deep learning based, um, you know, CNN uh, has been so good for recognizing objects and actions. So, uh, but that's a good point. So, and then there's kind of argument that I'm trying to make. So, um, we're now kind of trying to, uh, you know, make kind of same trajectory as of some of the text Yes? Um, I'm wondering if, like, uh, computer scientists are drawing on a lot of the social psychology literature about perception. I mean, I presume they are. And the whole literature about how a lot of the times the way we perceive things isn't like computers. We have a very gestalt sort of process where, I mean, the classic example is like the smiley face, right? It's like a computer might just see two dots in a skirt. But to us, it means something. We even understand that meaning and that we register it's a smiling face before we like look at it analytically. Whereas computers are kind of going in the opposite direction. They're kind of like aggregating things. Or I'm not sure about that, but that's my guess. So I'm wondering if there are a couple questions. First is um, if that like helps at all in terms of whether there's some sort of mathematical formulas by which you kind of take these different parts and kind of synthesize it. And the second concern is that um, it seems to me that even if um, meanings are always changing, right? They're socially constructed. And I think a lot about what's happened in China with censorship and people like coming up with all these different means um, uh, to kind of get around censors. And it seems like even if computer scientists would just start to be able to pin down with AI these different meanings that, that people, if they didn't want to be detected, they would just come up with new meanings. And it would be difficult to kind of reprogram the machines. And so I'm wondering if any of those thoughts have been discussed. Right. OK. I think there are um, many interesting sub-questions inside of your two questions. So I'll try, to try my best to um, address any some aspects of your question. So, um, so, so computer science is really a large discipline. So, um, and then there are different types of um, um, communities and different types of researchers. So like for example, computer vision community, most people don't care about social science aspect. Because again, the majority of research efforts have been going into just detecting what you are seeing rather than try to understand uh, what it means. So that's computer vision. But um, NLP, I think, um, like you said, uh, there are some people who are trying to import kind of higher level um, meanings. And then what you're uh, uh, mentioning, like, uh, you know, you somehow define kind of ontology of the logic and the rules and then try to use those kind of um, fixed analysis to um, actually follow the grammar that you specify to understand the meaning of the, uh, you know, the, you know, the data, either um, images or text. That would be a great opportunity, and then um, I think the kind of this kind of more earlier days on rule based AI um, approach, and, and then um, the, the both of those. Um, the problem um, would be um, it doesn't generalize very well to um, other cases, um, because um, a lot of cases, um, this kind of cartoon, for example, or advertisement, um, this relies on kind of creative um, um, compositions of symbols. And then symbols of symbols, so many things. And then humans um, somehow can almost instantly, immediately um, understand the meaning and then appreciate it. But um, um, how can you actually come up with those kind of grammar itself is actually uh, kind of interesting question to, to you know, AI uh, field. 
But um, um, overall, um, I think it's, it's actually unfortunate that the, um, whether the computer scientists and engineers do not really interact with the kind of social scientists. So they don't know the literature of um, social science. I mean, in a specific case, um, but I'm also the same. Same thing happens to social scientists. The social scientists um, don't know the actual technique. That's understandable. But um, um, this kind of work that uh, I'm demo I mean, I'm showing today. I mean, this, there are some people in computer science. Not too many, but um, um, some people in computer science have been working on this area of computational social science. But social scientists um, actually don't know um, or don't care. Or, or ignore um, those kind of big um, system work. And they don't try to um, learn from those kind of um, tools. Because um, they can consider those a separate work. Well, this is not our work. All the topics are similar. Um, so I think the communities are pretty separate. That's unfortunate because um, obviously the, the research questions are, are interrelated, and then um, better solutions can be found by um, actual collaboration. Between, uh, computer and, science. and then, um, what was your second question? Yeah, it was about this cat and mouse game that might emerge evolutionarily um, between. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, you yes. Know, like, yeah, yes. Right, right. Yeah, and then that's a good point. And then, um, so right now, the um, the computational tools to, for example, detect, and then um, let's just say we want to make a tool that can detect and identify some. Uh, messages, anti-government um, messages, something like that. And then um, that message will probably rely on some keyword for some um, people in a photograph, um, but nothing more than that. So like, usually, um, um, in the context of visual communication, visual public communication, like um, someone who are smiling are kind of positive indicators. But then not always. You can always um, change the meaning just by changing like a little bit of feature somehow, or put some text as if you're uh, creating a meme out of that photograph. But the system, the current machine learning uh, systems, um, cannot cannot detect or classify that as anti-government uh, thing. So uh, what that means is um is the systems are pretty um, limited right now. So it's not very difficult for those people to just get away, and then you can trick the system. But um, um, you're right that the system can be trained on the kind of new set of um, data that they classify as kind of anti-government um, messages, but um, people will carefully, quickly, again, um, develop um, something um, that can fool the system. So, yeah, so that's kind of interesting um, dynamic um, between human um, and then system. And then of course, like censorship is kind of more negative context, but um, um, you know, there are some human users who would try to abuse the system. Um, and then um, in kind of opposite direction, you could imagine that the system can actually try to contact the um, other users. Uh, but it's the same thing. So for example, a lot of techniques are, are already in place, for example, to detect um, fake accounts in social media, or terrorist accounts who are trying to recruit other people. And then they're going to use some you know, false information um, and then create some um, broad accounts. And then um, and then we can also develop classifiers that can classify those accounts. But then they will develop kind of better strategy, um, and use better features, and then use some real photograph, um, et cetera. But that is kind of getting more difficult and difficult. Uh, so yeah, I don't know the absolute answer for that, but I mean, that is um, a very important. So, um, so this is a kind of the um, um, the long term goal, uh, long term goal, and then um, um, I will, and I think I will really spend um, a lot of time to explain why these images are important. Um, it's just powerful, powerful in what? Powerful in um, persuasion. So um, images can change your mind, um, can change your opinions, and then there are many. Uh, many social science literature and then, um, research evidence showing that actually um, images and visual communication is a very powerful mode of communication that can actually affect uh, one's opinions. Um, and then but, um, those are kind of based on either kind of 
qualitative uh, analysis, you know, closer reading, <coughs> or based on very small size of samples. So how can we automate that analysis and then scale up? And then also, can you also discover discover something, some knowledges or some correlation or association that human researchers couldn't um, think? Right? There are some. There might be some hidden association um, that can be only discovered by data-driven knowledge. That's kind of another contribution of this computational method. So I'm going to skip this. So the actual concrete uh, project that I want to talk about, so it's kind of all background and context, um, is this uh, understanding political ideology from images. So um, the, what is ideology? What is ideology? Is um, um, there are of course several di de different definitions, but I'm um, kind of you know maybe internal the dimension of kind of political um, behaviors, um, um, and then that can be um, labeled as um, liberal versus conservative. In different contexts, uh, you might have a different dimensions, but I'm. Um, so uh, this is um, kind of the uh, direction of their political thinking and their preferences. And then this is an important um, criteria to divide the different democratic and then, um, positions and parties. And then um, the, there are many researchers um, that have shown that you can actually predict one's um, political ideology based on uh, many features like your text post or your online social network or many other things. So this study, um, in this study, we want to show that actually um, to test whether your political ideology can be also classified, uh, detected from your social media photograph. Not for your photograph, but um, uh, we focus on the politicians' photographs. And then um, if we can actually identify those kind of um, elements, what are they? Those are research questions. So like um, you know, people interacting with the, um, the people from uh, different religions, or people um, interacting with the um, soldiers, troops, law enforcement. What does it mean? Why are they doing that? How can we discover, detect those kind of uh, differences between different parties? Are the main research questions. Um, yeah. So this is um, um, the. The problem in communication called uh, visual frame, uh, polar communication. So you can frame certain events for the same individuals in a particular way um, so that you can make a specific argument for messages about <coughs> And then um, one very popular example in text is desk text. Desk text, ST text, this is um, basically in here in text. But um, uh, depending on which term, you use, then the voters, the citizens, may form different um, idea. So can we find the same thing in visual um, domain is the question. So like a little mathematically or statistically, what we're trying to do is uh, we have two sets of data. So one set of uh, images from Democrats and another set of images from Republicans. So you have two sets of visual data. So how do you characterize the difference? Is the question. So what we do is um, we are starting from almost scratch. So we don't make any assumption without anything. So typically, um, the kind of manual coding approach in social science we start from um, having a list of um, small, I mean short list of um, the um, code. Um, it could be you know, smiling face or, or some objects. So known, starting from known code list and then have the human coders actually annotate each item in the data set and then compare the difference on the <laughs> But you don't know, you don't know what are the actual difference that you will be able to find beforehand. So that's kind of one advantage of computing. You can actually start from an almost unlimited size of a dictionary, and you will try to discover what are the actual differences that can characterize the two different sets. Um, so we only identify the category of um, the um, um, items. So one is objects. So objects, um, we 
the largest audience. So you can name anything as thin as an object. So, uh, but of course, there are more important objects like a national flag or troops or weapons. It may symbolize you know, some um, national security, for example. Um, and then the other kind of other kinds of objects like uh, schools, children, um, that may stand for um, advocate for the important and investment in education, for example. So those are the um, our hypothesis. So I will um, focus on that. And then the second area is people. So objects one side, but the people can be also used as a element to signal particular ideology in images. And then people yourself. So these are photographs from the politicians. So Bernie Sanders himself is one person. But um, the people surrounding him are another people. These are basically tools. Yeah. I can composite the people that I want to. Uh, be with, and then uh, you create a um, particular message to the people. Especially emotion and expression is um, one um, type of sub features among people category. So um, whether you're uh, smile, or happy, cry. Um, but it, again, it's complex. Um, so smiling face doesn't always mean happy. And then um, you know, sad, sad. Feeling um, doesn't mean bad. <laughs> sad doesn't mean negative. If you are sad, if you look sad in a situation that you're supposed to look sad, then it's positive. If you look happy in that situation, you are um, awkward. So, um, and then um, it also depends on the import, uh, important thing is it also the, this kind of formulation doesn't always translate into different individuals. Um, the good example is Donald Trump. Like usually there are negative expressions, like a frowning, angry. This is not a good sign, typically, for politicians. But um, when that projects into his face, it means completely different things. He is angry. He is yelling. Right? He doesn't care about any kind of social norms in those kind of political contexts. Because when that comes to him, it means power, context. Well, not to everybody, but at least to some people. So um, this is a very complex topic. So, but anyway, our starting point is to um, detect individual expressions, facial expressions from the faces. Um, and then another thing um, that I'm not mentioning here is an actual um, demographic composition of people. So whether you are associated with the um, white male versus more dark set of people, this. Is another um, feature that might be important. So the, I also want to mention that this is not a random thing. I mean, this might be random. You might think this is random, but um, there, this is not random. When you are politicians, uh, we're running for election, right, for, for, um, for um, offices, and then when you put a photograph in your Facebook timeline, nothing is random. You select it. Well, probably your staff select it. And then even when you're actually taking those photographs, they probably um, crafted that scene very carefully. So everything is designed. So uh, you know, Barack Obama, he had a staff for watching everything. He uh, liked to roll his lips. It's not because um, this, it's fine. There's a step. Uh, typically, those kind of high profile uh, um, there are steps that can cause anything, everything. So. Um, so we're not trying to just understand the actual reality, but um, we're more interested in identifying what they want to deliver to their voters, to so their intent. So we want to understand that. So our data has been collected from Facebook. Um, <coughs> The data um, has been collected, actually, this data has been collected by my co-author, um, Jason, um, in the uh, University of Georgia. Um, so this data set has um, um, you know, 300 members of the Congress, um, the past Congress. Um, and then we have a new data set with, that we just collected again, but um, um, this analysis was based on the uh, previous Congress. So there are, um, and we only use white male uh, politicians in this study because there are you know, a lot fewer number of known white 
female politician, especially in the Republican Party. And then we wanted to balance two different sets, so we focused on white male uh, candidates. I mean, not, not candidate, actual congressman uh, in this study. Uh, if you actually um, analyze you know, females, then you, you might probably um, see different distribution. But I mean, this study will, will just focus on the white male. Um, and then, um, so then how can you automatically find objects in a scene or detect or classify um, the uh, emotions or expressions? And, um, um, and this is what we do with, you know, computer um, vision. So CNN, convolutional neural network. So, I, do, do you know what convolutional neural network is? I show you. Talk about it tomorrow if you guys are in question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So then uh, you'll learn that tomorrow. So, um, <laughs> essentially, it's a computational model um, um, algorithm that will um, that will allow you to um, um, uh, extract the actual features and then the offsets or our concepts um, from the raw data. And then um, the main difference between this kind of neural network and deep learning versus kind of traditional uh, machine learning opportunity is um, um, you don't have to do your own feature engineering. Um, so everything will be learned directly from the data. So, um, but practically, the benefit of a um, neural network is um, it works much, much better than the other types of the computational models. If you have enough data. If you don't have enough data, it probably doesn't work um, very well, but um, if you have the um, you know, right amount of data, then it will work better. So um, then what it will happen is um, we will give an image. Yes? How much data roughly does that mean? Right. Um, so it also depends on the, um, the actual task that you're trying to solve. But um, um, uh, the, there is a very famous um, data set called ImageNet. So it was actually a challenge, a benchmark challenge uh, where um, they provide raw data that different researchers train their own algorithm um, on the data. that data. Uh, that data set had uh, one million images. One million images and thousand categories. And this, each of these categories will um, indicate the main objects of each image. It will be a person, dog, and different types of dogs. Uh, and then the one interesting thing is um, um, when you do your analysis, when I do my analysis, I don't need to have a one million images. So what we are doing is um, um, called fine tuning. Or also called transfer learning is fine tuning is um, you will start from a pre-trained model that was trained with the one million, the one million images and then you will only kind of modify customize the entire model into your own data and then your own data can be a lot smaller so in this study um, we use something like uh, 20,000 20,000 images so then what's happening is um, um, majority portion of this whole model you can still learn from the one million images, but then you tune only kind of the top layers um, closer to your output variables, um, tailored to your own data. So you're kind of combining um, both sides of um, um, benefits. So is each, is each image a sample? Yes. Um, and then um, you could also um, use an even smaller um, um, training set, but um, um, it all depends on the actual task that you're trying to solve. Um, so, so we train the model. So, uh, okay, so the, this model will basically take one image, a single image, as an input. And then the output, the target variable here is a party affiliation. So this is a binary classification. So um, there's only one output which would indicate either Democrat or Republican. This supervised learning because we all know their ground truth body population. And then the output, the actual output um, is a mirror number. So from 0 to 1. Um, typically in classification, you will pick up one threshold, decision threshold, and then assign binary class to each sample. But um, um, because we actually want to have a continuous scale. So we just take that raw output. So um, we perform 
campaign for cross-validation and split by person. Um, so the actual accuracy, if you want to classify the party, party population from each position based on just one single random um, image, then um, you will get 60% accuracy. We also did human text. We put these images, um, some sample of 200 images in the computer. And then the accuracy was 60%. <coughs> So it's as good as a human, uh, but um, uh, it could be better. I will um, show you some more examples. But uh, when you aggregate um, 150 images, then um, you get 80%. Not just use one image, but you use multiple images of the same position, then aggregate their scores, then um, you can see some um, accurate or accurate results. Um, and then these are some examples, our top predictions um, for Democrats. So these are images classified as um, um, Democrat images. And what you're seeing is um, you know, minority and education, people, open scenes, um, natural um, scene, ocean. This is a Republican, where you're seeing more like a you know, man with the formal um, red ties, office space. Getting over national flag? Yes. Um, so I'm a little unclear. So you you just learned the latent features from this data, or was it from the pre-trained? Was the how did you use that pre-trained model? So you start from pre-trained model, right? Which detects isn't that trained to like detect objects in a image or what? So ImageNet is um, um so, uh, precise is um, um the um, for image classification. Mm -hmm. So it'll just assign one label for each image. And then uh, what we're doing is um, so there are multiple layers in your network. And then that final layer, the last layer, is actually responsible for um, taking those features detected from images and then assign the particular class out of the file. We delete those um, um, that layer and then replace that with another um, linear layer. Um, who, which will take the same features as an input, but I'm having just one output. And the one output in our case is um, party population, Democrats and, and Republican, and then keep doing uh, fine tuning. So then feature will be uh, still detected from uh, the kind of um, lower layers of the model. And the final output is um, um, you know, Republican and Democrats. And these are actual examples, the top and then bottom score the examples from on both sides. Yes. Is it an issue of parameterization? You're saying like I have only 20,000 observations for, for my latest thing, so the, only, the best thing I can do is to parameterize just the latest layer of my neural network and use all this, because it's very deep, all the structure I learned from the previous yeah. one. So actually, we didn't freeze precisely. So, um, so this is what's happening. So you have many layers, right? You have many layers. This is how the neural network actually is organized. There are many layers. And the layers meaning um, one operation. So you perform one operation and another operation to the output of that previous operation. So there are a series of operations. That's how this neural network works. So, um, and then the original, the image net pre-trained model have many layers. So we delete the last layer. Then have another insert a new layer. But then we didn't freeze. These are still being updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do later. But um, um, the way that it works is um, um, the actual learning will happen incrementally, gradually. So um, you will not actually change much from the uh, lower layers, even when you're doing fine tuning, because these are correct features. And then these features will be like, um, you know, basic objects, base or, or edges or some, you know, some kind of textures. So that will not change much. But um, um, in a higher level association, like uh, what kinds of objects are associated with which party, those will be learned completely from scratch. So that's fine tuning. And then, um, is that what you guys are just gonna cover in tomorrow? We, we, uh, we have to decide what we're covering okay. tomorrow. Right, so um, I have a paper, another paper. This paper is about introducing the technical details about neural network for social science, but for political science, um, you could also um, take a look at that paper better. Yeah. So in the earlier slide, I mentioned that you need the input graph. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
So, right. Well, what that means is um, um, the um, especially for Democrats, they have a lot of uh, not photographs, but um, like um, you know, just posters. The text. Yeah. Sometimes they have text, and sometimes they just have a logo. So um, that is a um, very easy to detect. But um, if we just use that, then our just go. So my issue is that Right. So, uh, okay. So that's a good question. So the um, so here our research question is not to is not about classifying this more accurately, but uh, we want to understand what are the features. So infographic is uh, just the first feature that we already discovered. So actually, the the reason that we actually discovered that infographic was that uh, we first trying to class fire and then sort of the example. And then all of these uh, Democrats um, images were infographics. So we already run them. So then we just moved on and then focus on the actual features in real photographs. Because that's easily separable from um, the actual photographs. So um, I'm going to quickly go through the, um, the other results. So we take them measures. So aggregated them, um, predicted ideology from photographs, and then compare that with the external um, index. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this um, bit of nominate. This is a known index, a uh, known index of the political ideology of congressmen, um, as then estimated from their actual voting um, um, records. So this can be uh, triggered as kind of ground truth, ground truth uh, nominate score, and then this is our output. <coughs> Then you'll see that actually you can, um, there's correlation uh, for the entire set, but um, there's also internal correlation within party, which means um, there's variation um, inside each party. <coughs> and then we didn't train, we didn't train the model on that signal. We didn't train the model on this one. This was um, just unobservable, uh, not observable in our training. But um, still, if you just start from the binary party population, <coughs> still. Um, reconstruct that would be variation to some extent. So, many people have concerns about sort of black box nature of deep learning, machine learning, or any kind of computation method. Um, people are skeptical about um, how you can trust. How you can trust and then what are you getting? How much time? You're at 11.54, so... Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so, so that is um, important, right? So the whole research question is not just to classify those images, but um, we want to understand what are the actual differences. That's more important. So, um, and then deep learning is very powerful, but uh, um, their behavior is more obscure because you have so many parameters compared to a simple linear model. And then this is, this is kind of one. Of techniques that you can use to identify what the model actually internally learned and utilized to perform the classification. So this is called GraphCam, and then what it does is um, to highlight the actual region of images that contributed more to the classification per each image. So then you will see some actual features like rural people, maybe uniform, or national flag, or protester sign. So this is one way to identify what well, are actual features um, um, for your task. Um, and then you can apply this from you know, bottom up. So you have a data and train the model, and then sort of uh, try to decode the model behavior. So it's different from kind of top-down approach by uh, manual coding. Yes. Um, have you ever used the approaches that, like, in, with word embeddings, where we make, we you know, subtract two things and get out a late dimension like gender or something? Have you seen that sort of method? With so you can get you can get out some kind of feature in the embedding that like is the dimension of gender if you take man minus woman. Man minus woman. Um, yeah. So um, okay. So that's a good question. So um, so you're asking um, essentially if you can actually split the sample space somehow. Mm -hmm. And then you could take right. like an image like right. with something that's labeled one way and labeled the others, right. I don't know, subtract the two representations. Yeah. So in this case, we have only one label, which is um, Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
we cannot remove it. I guess not in this then, case. Yeah. But Although we have uh, the entire data set have also gender and then um, other things. So that's probably possible if you actually include all of it. Just, um, and then um, another thing um, maybe related to what you're suggesting is um, um, if you have the feature, like pi, like this is one feature. But um, if you remove them, like if you remove them, uh, if you remove the sample or the signals, uh, project all the images orthogonal to this kind of feature of um, pi, then you may be able to discover a second important feature. So that's, and that's actually kind of a um, um, uh, research question in um, machine learning called feature selection. So um, the question here is, um, can you actually name individual one or not? Because um, um, this image is still, you need to see what they are individually. But that's very good point. Um, so we also um, the, um, examined the actual emotions and expressions. And then what we found was um, the Republicans um, smile more. <laughs> Is it surprising? Yeah, I think it's really? surprising. Well, yes. Why? <laughs> what kind of the data from? Yeah. Face, uh, Facebook. Uh -huh. what, what, what time frame? Uh, oh, oh, I see. What's it then? I think it's for. Um, so these are photos people put posted themselves on Facebook. Right. So it's like Self a lot of like selfies. Yeah. And yeah. Like, okay. The 2020 to 16. So during Obama era. So <laughs> there are many research actually, you know, conservatives. Um, they report a higher degree of um, happiness in general. So they are they tend to be happier actually. They complain less. Conservatives. Maybe because um, they're wealthy. Or maybe because um, they, they, you know, but um, the idea of a we call it, I mean, conservatives is um, you kind of adapt the status quo. You don't want to change. That's conservative. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to change if you're already happy, for example? So I don't know, I don't know why it's a right explanation, but um, this actually, um, you know, our find is actually um, well aligned with the, kind of, the literature of political um, um, psychology. But, um, there was one recent paper um, actually arguing the conservatives are actually not happier. Um, so what they did was um, to um, analyze the official follow photographs of politicians, and then they did very fine good analysis, and then they actually concluded, um, you know, Democrats that actually their smiles are more clear, more genuine. But of course, this is a different data set. They use some the one you know, official photographs, um, but we kind of measure the, um, the actual photographs of um, social media. Yes. Um, but of course, it's limited because like these photographs are coming from Facebook, right? Like the way people are, they're first off, a lot of them are choosing to portray themselves. Well, maybe not all are because they're getting photos taken by others and they're getting posted yeah. by Facebook. But whatever selection. Um, gener data generation process which by some photos or images, not just photos, but images of people are excluded, the, the ones we're, yeah. you're sampling from are those that are going to be, yeah. so if there's differences between yeah. how the frequency with which people smile and the frequency with which they smile on photos on yeah. Facebook, that's right. Yeah. yeah, it's right, but um, I don't think that's a limit. Mm -hmm. What else space do you see politicians? you're not going to go into their houses and then monitor their facial expressions 24 hours. That's not what it matters. <laughs> what, what matters is uh, what, what we are actually get to see. And then those are uh, media portrayers. But the question is uh, what data, what distribution is actually more important? Because traditionally, it's the role of mass media, newspapers, <coughs> CNN, cable news. They will choose the specific visuals, and then that will be the features, and then the data that the public will be um, exposed to. And the social media kind of allow them to have their own spaces, so they can choose whatever they want to uh, um, show. And then interesting question is then, then will the public respond more to those kind of social media, their own outlets, or still kind of go to the um, traditional um, places? So we don't know. Um, that's kind of the, one of the core the questions that we're trying to do um, um, in my as well. But yeah, but good question. Um, and then 
And then also there's a kind of another kind of kind of questions of we use um, old images, but um, obviously some images are more important, like them um, go viral and then see more. And then we don't know. We don't know actually which images were actually seen to each user. I mean, we have something like a light or a comment, but um, um, kind of indirect measure. So we don't know. Um, but that's kind of actual limitation in the analysis. Um, so that was expressions. And then um, I'm just kind of wrapping up quickly. And then we also uh, measured the demographics, um, diversity in the demographics. And then not surprisingly, uh, you know, uh, Republicans, um, they focus more on white male. And then um, this is the final thing um, that we analyzed. So, um, so, so when it comes to outsex, so of course the earlier visualization um, highlighting different rhythms will actually qualitatively show these are important rhythms, but um, uh, why do you want to have the actual vocabulary <coughs> and then uh, identify important outsex? So then you need to start from a model with the um, you know lot of vocabulary and dimension and label uh, so many things. Uh, we don't have a resource for that, but unfortunately you can use some um, um, commercial API and the Google Vision API. We use Google Vision API and then um, it'll you know, detect those concepts like a military officer, and a person. These are the concepts that we like to associate more frequently associated with the Republicans, and then kind of natural scene, seashore. Education schools. These are the concepts associated with the um, um, democracy. So um, these are actual images. I mean, compare them. So I'm going to just skip this. So key findings. Yes, we can um, correctly um, classify the actual photographs, and then um, these are actual concepts associated with more um, this party and then the expression. Um, one last thing that I want to like mention, uh, mention very quickly is um, you could use these like, commercial APIs. You know, there are many um, choices that you can use. Um, and then you could also train these models yourself. Um, there are two problems. Um, one problem um, is um, a related problem. So the bias in the data set um, is um, this commercial APIs, especially for base and the main other thing, have been known to contain bias. Like it doesn't work well on non white population. Non white, actually, not non white, black, female. Population. This base recognition system doesn't work well on black female. Dark skin female. Um, and then this is a critical for social science researchers because if you want to perform some analysis like you want to compare the um, you know emotions of um, female politicians and then um, male politicians. But um, what you need to have is um, your model need to be accurate but also consistent. Error rate per different subpopulation should be identical. Otherwise, uh, you are producing garbage. But um, the commercial APIs are black box. You don't know. I know. I know what kind of system they use. I know. The, um, um, it's the same system. So the, um, like a couple of years ago, 10 years ago, everybody used a different model. But right now, everyone uses the same model. But the key thing is the data. Data is all different. So we have no idea how this data is coming from. So um, that's the um, real danger um, if you just use commercial APIs. So um, uh, we uh, made a new data set, new data set of base, um, which is more kind of balanced on different races, um, that we call the fair base. Because I want to be fair. <laughs> um, and then um, these are the actual units. So um, a little blurry, but this is our data set, and then these are others. So you can clearly see it. Which one is more diverse? And then the other other data set are usually coming from you know sources like uh, Wikipedia, IMDb, mm -hmm. or web search celebrities, politicians, which are biased. Yeah. So this works better, and then we know these are more reliable, um, consistent. So these are uh, you know, a new direction for um, very interesting direction for computer scientists as well. How to make this AI and machine learning system. Um, fairer and more democratic and more intelligent. So that is also important um, for social science and the social scientists will need to understand this might be you know, some potential issues. Um, but again, so the, to conclude the computer vision uh, and also social media data, so you need a method but we also want to have a data. So these are um, can be very useful tools to study um, human behavior. So
using um, computational and scalable as well. Um, I think that's it. Um, thank you. And then uh, I don't think we have a time for questions. Thank you. <laughs>